Okay, um, thanks for joining me, Tom. Um, I'm talking to Tom Martin, who is um, one of the founders of Honest Burger, who we have entered into a collaborative project with, but really we're here to talk about um, you and your brand. And so, yeah, could I just sort of first kick off by saying, where did Honest Burger come from? How did, how did you guys get this together? Well, thanks for um, having me on, Gwen. And yeah, I, it, it, all, it originated um, from a marquee, actually, down in Brighton. Um, but to go even like one step slightly before that, it was Phil and myself. We were working in an amazing restaurant in Brighton called Ridlam Fins. Um, I'm sure some of your listeners have heard of um, like amazing seafood and champagne uh, oyster bar. And, you know, they do that just so, so well. Um, and it was the first time either of us had ever worked in a restaurant where you can really feel a sense of uh, of kind of family and community. And, you know, like when you <clears throat> you might you might have a restaurant in Europe that you go to if you go on holiday and, and you know, you re even when you go back, like, you know, in between, you might not go back for five years and the same people, same people. working there. And it's <laughs> yeah. like, you just, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a family. And I know that sounds really cheesy, but it is. And it, that's, not the way restaurants are seen over here. Um, but that restaurant for, for this brief period of, it was about sort of 18 months, you know, I met Phil there, who's, um, you know, my business partner. I met my wife there. Um, no way. It, wow, was, wow. it was such a, a community, like a tight knit um, sort of friendship group. And, and me and Phil were just working there. I was working there to try and pay for my uni. Um, Phil was doing a journalism degree so it wasn't like we were kind of like right let's go into restaurants and then let's try and open a burger bar and then blah 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 so, so what, what, what were you doing there were you a cook chef? no no I was just a barman right so, okay but but I was always interested in food and I, I had this you know the food kind of started slowly drawing me in because I like to eat nice food <laughs> like a lot of us do and I had this terrifying moment at university where I realized that no one was there to cook for me. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, like, it honestly, it hit me like an absolute train. I was like, fuck, what am I going to do? <laughs> like, I had, I, you know, I, my, my, my parents divorced and both my mums were amazing cooks and they used to just feed me and feed me. And I got to uni and I was like, oh my God, I, I, I don't know how to cook anything, like literally anything. Um, so I started to teach myself and I started to get interested. And then I got this job in Riddle and Finns and the bar backed into the kitchen so well that's, that's, that's funny you say that because i i did o and a level home economics for the entire opposite reason because my mum <laughs> couldn't cook oh no, really you had to learn so, so yeah. i thought i have to do this because i love food and i and she's terrible so. well, i think if you like food you'll find a way right you'll find yeah. a way to get nice food um i think so you know and for me i i just had this kind of epiphany in in sainsbury's on lewis road in brighton i genuinely was like it was so formulaic. I was like, I need to learn to cook. If I don't, I'm going to eat crap food and I can't live eating crap food. So, like, like so that a was, single light bulb moment kind of thing. Yeah, it really was. Oh. I was like, I, but I, even then, I didn't think I want to go into food. I just thought I need to feed myself and I need to eat nice food. So, I have to learn. And, and then I, I started to um, cook meals for my mates. Um, and we, you know, we'd have like a group of sort of 10 mates and they'd all give me a, you know, whatever they had in their pockets. And it was, might be three or four quid, it might be a fiver, <laughs> but you'd get a kitty of money and it would be enough to do something. Okay. So we were eating like beef Wellington sort of every couple of weeks because wow. <laughs> I'd love to cook it and I wouldn't mind going down. Just and open the book and <laughs> yeah. And I, and I was cooking all these like stuffed chicken thighs with pistachio and sausage all these like quite technical things and i was you know, making all sorts of mistakes but i was really enjoying it but even then i still wasn't like i should go to food because i really like food um it was actually when we got the job in riddle and fins and we started to really enjoy that and i started to get on really well with phil as a as just a mate really um sorry can you hear that is that my phone's buzzing away um <clears throat> that's all good um it was, started, it was when we started to do some outside catering jobs um, for this same company. That was when we were like, maybe this is something we could go into. Um, because, you know, outside catering, the barriers to entry are far more realistic for most people. And by outside catering, I mean street food. But back then, right. Right. And maybe, maybe I was, maybe I was um, not as clued into street food as I could have been. But this is 12 years ago. 
I don't remember hearing the term street food back then, and certainly not in Brighton. There, there wasn't this kind of cool underground edginess to street food. It was pretty low market, pretty budget, um, and it was kind of food festivals or you know working at big you know events. You know um, there was a, a Burley horse, not Burley horse shows. There's a big horse show outside Brighton that that was like what we were thinking. Maybe we could like yeah. maybe we could work there. And that's that was the kind of extent of what we thought we were gonna we were gonna go into, and and it was it was kind of I mean, it was kind of naive of us, but we just thought you know we've got very little cash. We we managed to pull together about two and a half grand each. Yeah, which you're not gonna you need six figures to get into a restaurant premises, right? So Pretty much, like yeah, yeah. Even if you do, well, I mean, I, we'll talk about Brixton later. We did that on a very paltry sum of money, but. Um, okay. But but yeah, most time if you're talking about a high street restaurant, you're into you're well into six figures. Um, so that was just never on the cards for us. Um, so yeah, it was kind of like let's just give it a go, really. And 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 it was, I mean, it was it was. It, yeah, the, I always say when I, I speak to people who want to go to business, I'm like, just get on with it. Don't wait until you're old and and you lose your edge <laughs> and you lose you get you start worrying about things like. The best thing we did is we went, we had the idea and then we were like, cool, let's just do it. And we literally just went head first, straight into it. We didn't have a care in the world. We didn't worry. We weren't over strategizing or over concern. The naivety of youth. Yeah, uh, the <laughs> arrogance of youth, right? Yeah, and, and it was the best thing. We just jumped in. And, and I think, you know, procrastination is the worst trait that any human being has, I think. Like procrastinating in... Everyone does it every single day of their lives. Um, but when it's something as important as like a career defining moment, you've got to just like jump feet first into it. And that's what we did. And, and yeah, look where we did, are did now. Did it feel like that at the time though? Did, did you think that, did it feel like a career defining moment or, or was it just like, let's see what happens? Yeah, it, for me, it was like, I remember Phil, Phil approached me um, and said, you know, do you want to do something? Um, you know, you, you, Phil was, Phil's very good with people. and work in the room and he was the always going to be the front of house guy and I was learning my kind of craft with food so when Phil said so he came we went for a couple of beers and a couple of beers turned into about 10 and then we started to decide to you know write the write the wrongs of the world um in a in a tent flipping burgers and um it just felt right and I think to be fair I didn't really have much going on I was failing a business degree from Brighton Uni so um i was i was in i was oh, like, that, okay. oh, the irony right <laughs> yeah i know i know now they invite me back to speak <laughs> at their university campus and i'm like <laughs> i said to the guy i was like you really don't want me to do this because i'm probably going to tell people to not go to university <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um but no it was great it was an amazing moment amazing time for us and and we um we learned we learned a huge amount about ourselves um and we kind of we kind of like unknowingly stumbled into this brand that that was a real um, kind of encapsulated all these things that that were really meaningful to us personally, and I think that's really important with any brand. And you guys are, you know, you're you're kind of a great example of that. Like, if yeah. you want to create something authentic, well, per- per- it has to be something you believe in. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. When per- you're per- when you're doing something to just say. Oh, you know, I see a trend here. I want to jump on that bandwagon. Yeah. And sometimes that can be successful, but a lot of the time, customers see right through it, and and people that work for you see right through it. And that's one of the yeah. hardest things. You know, when you're trying to grow something with lots of employees, they need to believe in the same thing you're believing in. In, in the bigger mission, but can can I just yeah. jump back a little bit, just because there's a bit that you kind of glossed over a bit there, which is what were the actual mechanics of getting started? You mentioned that you started it on a couple of thousand pounds, but what did that actually involve? Where you know, how did you how how did you actually physically get it going? What what, what did you did you get some money in and just bought a burger grill or, or what? what happened? Basically, I mean, but when we decided we were gonna, um, the first of all was the name that was the big one. Yeah. Um, so Phil um, give complete um, complete uh, sort of ownership of the name. He he nailed it with that, and that came from the concept of businesses not being honest um you know lots of businesses do things that don't 
necessarily feel right. Um, and Phil thought, wouldn't it be great if there was a business called Honest that was just completely transparent? Everything you wanted to know, if you, you, know, if you couldn't see it on the website or, or when you're talking to someone, you know, just, just fire an email over and we'll tell you anything. And it was this kind of concept that food businesses, you know, aka sort of restaurants and street food businesses, they should be more honest about where their food is from um, and what kind of business they want to be and how they treat their people and mm-hmm. all these things. So, so the word was, was there and we kind of latched onto it. We were like, that's a really cool word. And it was crazy that no one had really used it <laughs> in the space. You know, there was innocent smoothies was, was around, but we didn't think, we didn't kind of look at that at all because that was a completely different sector. It was, it, so it, was, it was that we had this word and then, then yeah, we had two and a half grand each. We bought, um, we decided to do burgers and chips. I, I was like doing the food. Phil wanted to do fish and chips. And I was like, not a chance. Um, burgers and chips. We, we, we lucked out because we didn't think, you know, the, the, there's a growing burger market and the UK London burger scene is about to explode. It was basically, I was just cooking lots of barbecues on Brighton Beach um, and I was cooking lots of burgers. And, and we, we thought they'd be, you know, they're kind of every, every man food aren't they that, that kind of working class just kind of eat with your hand bosh feels good that that's what we we wanted to to kind of it, it to stand for and you know that word honest ties into all those things as well got you um, right so yeah and then to, to actually form a business and again this is i know the internet was thriving 12 years ago but god it doesn't feel like it was as much as it is today like <laughs> i remember going on on a search engine i think it was like yahoo and trying to just search you know how do you set up a company and we had to actually find a guy to set up our business and it was called the honest eating co um because we were going to do um some we didn't want to just do burgers at that stage we, we were getting quite into hog roasts as well because you know the longest queue is always a hog roast when you're looking at outside catering events. We thought, you know, you could bang out way more numbers doing it that way. Um, so we set up this company with this dude who was like, I think he lived in Worthing. And I kid you not, it took us three years when we set up Honest Burgers to unwrite the wrongs we'd done at Honest Eating Co. when we had to try and dissolve that company because we had, we'd made such a hash of it. Um, and all our paperwork was all over the place, so it, it was—it so wasn't—it wasn't a good setup. Um, right. <laughs> no, I mean um, I've I've done it a couple of times, and just sort of paid an accountant to file it and register it and, and do the share allocations and all that kind of thing. And, yeah. And, and I, I could appreciate that if you got it wrong at the beginning and then it grows, it could it could lead to all sorts of pain. So I think I think the takeaway from this is is um, do it properly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, do it properly and get people far more um, skilled than you in this space <laughs> um because yeah we 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 kind of tried to skimp and i think we paid him like 150 quid or something and yeah it was cost us thousands in the end by the time oh, we set up honest burgers because of all the all the wrongs but but yeah we got that set up and it was my mum um, my mum had a friend of hers who decided to go um out on a limb and she booked us for our first job and it was um, her daughter's um, 18th birthday party, 120 <laughs> burgers, um, 18th birthday party um, out in Somerset. We were absolutely bricking it. Um, we made tons of mistakes. I bought uh, the biggest thing I did. I remember, um, sounds so small, but I bought cracked black pepper instead of ground black pepper. The cracked is, is chunky bit of pepper. Rocks, yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> and I and we and we used to pre-season our burgers then. Because again, we didn't know that pre-seasoning a burger is like the, the antichrist of, of burgers, um, burger sort of um chefing. So we pre-seasoned the burgers, we we mixed it all up, we made them into patties, we cooked first one about 10 minutes before we were due to um serve these little kids and ate it, and we were like, oh my god, that's disgusting. <laughs> um <laughs> It's so peppery. Um, luckily, all the kids were, I say kids, they were 18. They were all they're, they're absolutely all on cider. plastered by about <laughs> 15 minutes into it. So they didn't give two shits. Um, and I remember we, we, done, we did triple cooked rosemary salted chips there. And I remember everyone went absolutely mad for the chips. They were like the best chips I've ever eaten. Talk me through triple cooking chips. What, what's the, the mechanics <clears throat> behind that? How does that work? 
basically when you're talking about a chip, you've got the main thing is starch. So you can, you, you know, we could do hours talking about chips. It's starch and dry matter, and and how do you get, um, how do you get the right levels of that to, to become crispy in the end? Um, and you can either go down the variety again, which we had no idea about them, but you can find certain varieties that just lend themselves well to um, to crisping up. That the reaction, one. right? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. But the, the best example, if you think of a sweet potato, mm -hmm. you can never just deep fry a sweet potato and it'll come out crispy. It doesn't matter what you do. You triple cook it, whatever. It will always be soggy because yeah. it has a too high sugar, too high sugar content, okay. uh, which is linked to its starch content. So you've got to, um, which is, you know, if you want to get a sweet potato fried that's crispy, it's, it's coated in something like a yeah. fish and chip shop batter. Yeah, because um, you guys do that, right? You, you do sweet potato fries as well? No, or? no, we don't oh, do sweet don't? potato. Okay. No, no, we never do them because you kind of have to buy them in because they need a very specialist bit of kit to do a good right, sweet potato right. fry. But we're not buying anything. I've never yet, understood you know. why people like them. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I think sweet potato, like a, a you know roasted sweet potato in the oven, is nutritious. That's a different thing. With a great big thing for you, or isn't something. It? But I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but sweet potato fries for me, they're they're, they're just sickly sweet oh, and poor they're, they're imitation. All, yeah. yeah. Compare <laughs> yeah, that anyway. to a. Anyway, yeah. To, to, Back to, to triple, triple, cook, triple cooking. cooking. You, you you boil. Um, you you boil it down to you. So cut them, boil them chill them and chilling super important because so boiling water yeah boiling just normal salted water okay so that's taking the starch off the outside yeah and take starch off and you'll see the fissures on the outside start to, to create you want to see you know when you chop a chip it's got very straight edges yeah once you've boiled it it's about five six minutes you then want to see the edges start to rough start up to break up like when you're making yeah. roast potatoes exactly it yeah yeah okay. and you can take that as far as you want you know like Heston Blumenthal when he does it he takes it to the point where they literally are about to crumple um but you want to just see some some fissures on the edges start to create chuck it in your freezer chill them down then you fry them at a low temperature about 120 130 degrees okay um and that just starts to set in the crispiness on the edge um take them out chill them down again then fry them at a high temperature at kind of like 180. Oh, and wow. that's when you get the crunchy, um, crispy edge. And then, then I mean, that is a, it's a hell of a process, but to do that uh, for a dinner party is brilliant. That's crazy. So, so it involves two lot, two rounds of chilling. Um, so, yeah. and, and you still do them like that now? We don't do them like that now. Now we've, we've worked out actually, you can double fry them. Um, and, and using a very high tech, um, blast freezer, which would chill you down to about minus 15 in an hour yeah you know it's a big walk-in thing that's what you you need and obviously you know, no one's got that at home but if you use if you use um heating and cooling um very cleverly nowadays you can get uh, very commercially you can get a really great crispy chip um just by that and obviously now we've got an amazing relationship with our potato supplier so we get the right varieties that's the really most important thing you know when you're when you're buying potatoes from a supermarket or a local shop you've normally got maybe two varieties and it's always Maris Piper and King Edwards really so yeah, yeah. um you want to get you know there's there's hundreds of potato varieties and then it's like I said it's an absolute science to get it um absolutely bang on and you look at the way McCain's have a variety they basically buy 100 percent of of it around the entire world because it is the best variety for um for a chipping and you can't even get it anywhere else perfect sugar starch and water content and all the rest yeah. of it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, so yeah back to the 18th <clears throat> birthday party yeah so Sorry, this is your first around. kind of yeah. trial run and you are you're triple cooking at that one so they all yeah. the, the burgers pre-seasoned mistake because that toughens the meat yeah so anything if you imagine salt will will draw moisture out of anything like yeah. um you could leave salt on a piece of wood and leave it long enough it will slowly pull moisture out of it like it's yeah. an unbelievable mineral um and if you put something like salt on uh, any form of protein um but something like a like a chopped steak or minced steak for burgers which has already been through quite an ordeal yeah you put salt into that it will literally just pull all the moisture out of it and you will end up with this kind of red Dry, chewy kind of yeah and it's and it firms up the texture it does all sorts of things so so never ever 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 pre-season a burger it's just you don't need to you season it in the pan and that's it after the crust has formed 
No, no, you can literally put it. Um, I mean, we well, the way we do it is we put the burger on the grill. Yeah. We season the raw side. Okay. Wait till it's flipped, and then season the cooked side. Okay. Um, and you season heavily because remember you've got no season going through that. Um, yeah. So you want a, a decent level of seasoning on top, and also when you're seasoning a burger, you've got to remember, remember you've got bread, you've got cheese, you've got a relish, you've got a mayonnaise. All those things are fighting for seasoning as well. So, you know, our burger eaten on its own, just the patty would taste overly salty. Um, but because once it's, it's carrying the seasoning else, for the rest of it, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. exactly. So anyway, all right, 18th, but this was your trial run on this 18th birthday party and, and you had some, some learning curve from this. Well, what happened after this? Where, where did you go from there? I mean, we, we struggled, to be honest with you. We, we, were, we were hooked um, completely because it was like, you know, we, we'd made, I think we made probably about 300 quid or something from that job, but it felt like, you know, all the money in the world. And we were like, oh my God, we've, you know, we've actually physically made money ourselves. <laughs> this time um, next year, Rodney. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so we were looking at ways to get more, more business and we struggled. And this is, you know, we, we were both working full-time restaurant jobs. So we were doing... 40, 50 hours a week in Riddle and Fins at this stage um, and trying to, to find pitches. And it was the finding pitches we were struggling with. And you, you, you need a lot of money, actually, to go into any um, decent pitch now. You generally have to pay quite a substantial pitch fee. Um, and then you need to have money to pay for the stock you're going to go and try and sell, right. which can completely cripple businesses. You know, we've, we've been to festivals before that have been a write-off and you see, you know, because of weather and, and you know, they, we went to festival number six and it basically rained for three days solid. And the trader next to us was like, I'm going to struggle to come back from this. And it was really fucking heartbreaking, heart, um, breaking because it was just like, you know, you're, you've, got to, you've got to kind of give yourself an opportunity to do well at these events. But for us, we brought loads of stock with us. We, we, we failed at that festival miserably. That's fine. We just brought the stock back and we used it in our restaurants. For an independent street food business, they bring shitloads of stock to a festival. They might not have a job for, for seven um, days. You're done. Yeah. And it's done then. So, yeah. so it, it, it's a really tough one. And we didn't realize this when we went into the game at all, that you needed to have a lot of cash just to get into pitches. So, we, yeah, we kind of bumbled through and we... We looked anywhere and everywhere for pitches and we, we did a couple of food festivals that went quite well. We did some fireworks festivals that didn't go so well. Um, and we kind of were just, we, we were in it and we absolutely loved it, but I don't know how much longer we could have done that for. It wasn't a sustainable um, from a business sense model for us because we were kind of, we would, we would empty our bank accounts on the way to, you know, on the way to every job, we'd have this conversation. We were like, if we didn't make any money out of this job, we're fucked. Like, that's it. <laughs> um, and it was kind of like, yeah, we need to make this work. And we did. Every single time we, we scraped by um, and we just about got enough to pay for another job. So you just need um, that working capital then. You need that sort of yeah. float, as it were. Yeah, yeah. And we, we, had, we had our 5K in, the, in, the, in day one. We spent two and a half grand on a marquee, which I look back at it and I'm like, that was mental. Like, <laughs> spend that kind of money um, on on the marquee, but yeah, we did, and it's still standing today. To be fair, um, <laughs> so yeah, it was that working capital, and then it was it was a very opportune um, thing that happened about us going into the restaurant business. Was um, our third co-founder Dorian? Um, he's got a very um, he had a very sort of tidy career under his belt, working Strada and Bills and a lot of the big branded um, restaurant concepts in London. And he just heard about us through a friend of a friend. Um, he all he knew was we were two guys from Brighton doing burgers, and we were called Honest. And he was like, "Can you know? Do you fancy coming to my house and cooking me burgers?" So we did. <clears throat> we drove up to a nice house in Clapham, um, cooked him burgers, covered his decking in grease. Um, it was not a great start to the relationship. Um, and he was like, "Yeah, I love you guys, and I think your food's great. Um, do you want to open a restaurant?" And we were like, ka-ching, like, yes, definitely. You know, this guy's going to, we generally we were like, cool, he's going to like bankroll us a restaurant. Um, and then we, 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 you know, the dust settled and we were like, cool, so how are we going to do this then? Dorian, he's a very clever man, um, shrewd Welshman. He was like, cool, so let's do this. I'll put in whatever you guys can put in. 
um, which he knew was the square root of fuck all. So we were like, cool, all right, um, let's do it. So, so yeah, we issued one more share, um, three shares in total. Um, and then Dorian jumped, came on board. And the, the idea then was, let's go out, let's find proper funding and let's open a high street restaurant. Like you said, you know, six figure plus um, to do something. We were, we were kind of eyeing up Soho because that was the, the kind of epicenter of food. Um, oh, so, still, so considering moving to London, because uh, this guy, yeah, your investor, was, he was in London rather than starting was, in Brighton. Exactly. Yeah, he was Clapham. Um, we thought if we're going to open a burger brand, it should be in London. Um, Byron was, was oh, I think they had three sites at this stage. GBK was very well established. Um, we felt very confidently that we were better than both of those brands. We were like, our food's better. We can do more. Um, less we less go to the, you know, to the big smoke and give it a go. Um, and that was when I, I had moved to London just to try and show Dorian I was serious about this. And, you know, we were trying to set up a business pack, um, trying to entice. He had a couple of potential friends who have done well for themselves. He may be interested in investing. Um, it was only then that I, I happened to move to Brixton because found a cheap flat on Gumtree. And I went for a wonder with my now wife um, because a mate of mine said, oh, you should look at Brixton Market. It's really cool. And literally just walked around it. And I was like in love with the place as soon as I saw it. I just thought, this is unbelievable. I've never in my life I've been anywhere like this. And it was, you know, a little bit, it's like a rough diamond and it's still yeah, is. And it, it should, it so should always, yeah. should always be a rough diamond. It's an amazing place. Um, and I was like, just straight on the phone to Dorian I was like, we guys, we've got to come to Brixton Village. We've got to do it. And they were like, you know, immediately was like, no, that's mental. We're not opening a restaurant in Brixton. Um, and as soon as I actually got them down and it was, the market was open on a Thursday, Friday night um, at that stage. And then I think it traded five days, no, maybe six days actually. So and they came you, down. What year was this, just for context? This was 2011. Gosh, so really not that long ago. You've This is really yeah. uh, exciting. Yeah, that would have. Okay. That would have been the beginning of 2011. Right. Um, I took them down there, um, and by the like, like they they basically as soon as I'm, I'm my wife says it's like it's my greatest greatest trait and also my most annoying trait is when I'm when I find something that I know is right, I, like no one can stop me, and I just went head first into this. And actually, what I should say is because I'd moved to London, I needed a job. Um, it sort of tied me over. Dorian um, very kindly got me a job working at Giraffe on right. South Bank because he was doing some consultancy work with Giraffe. Right, right, right. Um, and that was the worst job I've ever had in my entire life by an, a country mile. Um, I'd never, you know, I know I mentioned to you earlier in the podcast about working in a restaurant where you feel like you're part of a family oh, and yeah. you have fun with customers and you have a shot at the end of the meal and you know, you have a really nice environment, all the best things of hospitality. Giraffe on South Bank is the polar opposite to that environment. Transient workers from all over the place, no sense of community. I mean, I, I, I know that exact restaurant because I used to take the kids there sometimes. If we Exactly. The bank, that's, yeah. that's the only reason anyone goes there is to take their kids there. And, and to just, was, they can just smear ketchup on everything, you know. Exactly. And <laughs> really. then people like me would clean it up and parents <laughs> would click at you saying, can you just can you just come and and clean these mushy peas out of this chair that my child has just mashed in with his hand? It was, it was honestly one of the, the lowest moments of my life. I was just like, this isn't this is like uh, honestly the this, timing yeah. of that. So you would have been there in twenty eleven. It's you very been likely that, <laughs> that I would want to know. I certainly wouldn't have clicked my fingers at you, but. Yeah. I would have I would have made a, made a mess and apologised for it, but it's very likely that yeah. our paths cross there. Yeah, so I was working in there, literally like I was just hating life, hating everything about London. Like had no money, um, living in actually the flat me and my wife were living in. It was like a dingy little flat, but that was it was our first flat, so we were like thought it was a palace. Um, but yeah, that that was tough, and and when I could see this, you know potential light on the horizon which was you know i couldn't tell anyone that i may be going into business with dorian because dorian at that stage would come into the restaurant as you would in in those days and if you were part of the senior um 
exec team of a business like that, you walk into a restaurant like that and the fucking red carpet gets rolled out. Yeah, yeah, everyone yeah, yeah. kisses your ad. I have to pretend I even know the guy sure. um, because, you know, it was quite sort of sensitive. Um, and I, I, so I'm, I'm, you know, cleaning food out of floors and chairs and tables. And the, the worst thing about that restaurant actually was the, the, the relationship between the front of house and the back of house. So you were not allowed to speak to the back of house. The manager was the only person who could speak to the back of house, which I worked in some, some, some toxic restaurant environments in my life, but nothing like that, where That's if incredible. you tried to, you know, if, if someone complained about their food or, they, or their, the food was taking too long, oh, no, you, you weren't allowed to go and ask the chef, excuse me, mate, how, how long for table 10? We weren't allowed to do that. It was the manager had to go and do that. And it was like, it was, it was horrible. It was like a real like military kind of divide. And yeah, I hated every second of it working there. Um, but I managed to get the, the boys on board with Brixton, like I said, very easily. As soon as they saw it, they were like, yeah, this is amazing. Um, um, and we, can I just ask something about that? Did, did that experience kind of galvanize some ideas of how you wanted to run your place as like well this is the example of how not to do it so did did, did was there a benefit to that experience in some way no, <laughs> <laughs> no. not at all Nothing. i was trying to, really? know, trying to find a positive spin on that one but no yeah. i nearly lost i want I to be not this <laughs> i mean i suppose I, yeah i mean i very clearly didn't want to be that um but we would never have we'd never wanted to be anything like that because it was just it was it was offers it was vouchers and it was just it was the worst thing about you know certain restaurants and that the the rishi um eat out to help out scheme mm -hmm. on this is quite a tenuous link but i'm going to go with it was customers at giraffe i felt were they almost felt like you that they were doing you a favor by coming in at certain times because of the voucher schemes and the they always had a different menu that would kick in at this time and you'd get a better offer if you came in then. And the same with the um, Eat Out to Help Out. You speak to anyone in hospitality, that was some of the worst times they've ever had because customers felt like they were doing us a favour um, by coming into our restaurants. And it was almost okay. like it was a, you know, I pay my taxes. This is, this is my entitlement. Now dance serve, to my serve tune. Me, serve me, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was yeah. horrible. We had we had some some of the worst experiences. You, you had, we had our members of staff in tears, and they were just like, "Why are people being so fucking horrible to us? Like so nasty." And I know the world was in a very uncertain place, and it still is. Um, but yeah, customers customers can be really really nasty, um, and customers can be really fucking brilliant as well. You know, we we have we have some wonderful experiences with with lovely genuine human beings, but. It's a, it's a service industry at the end of the day. And some yeah. people take that to mean something it really doesn't mean. Um, you know, we've still got, you've still got a human being at the end of it. It shouldn't be this kind of entitlement, you know, and it should be an, you know, you're, I, when I go to a restaurant, I want to open myself up to having a good time. Um, and you've got to do that. It, it shouldn't be a kind of one way street here. Um, and if yeah. you do that, you can go out and have an, an amazing time. And, even if the food's not very good, you can have a great time with the person and you can um, make their life better. I, I used to I used to frequent your, um, I mean, I still do, but uh, I'd go to Honest Burger on Portobello Road and you had a Northern Irish guy there. Oh, Mark Brennan, yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, when, when we were with the family trying to decide where to go, I mean, we apart from, the, obviously, we love the food. I think it's the best burger in London. He was one of the reasons we kept going back there. Yeah, we he's pretty a much, master. Huh? He is a master. We, so we call yeah. we, what what Mark does. Mark did. Mark now lives in Sweden. It could be months, um, and he'd remember us as a family. Yeah. And he'd remember if it wasn't all four of us. He'd go, oh, "Where's your son or where's your daughter?" If it was just a, a different combination, and he'd go, "I know you guys like the booths. So I'll stick you in a booth when it was all arranged differently." Yeah. And um, and he even remember. I don't know how the guy did it. I mean, he remembered what we'd had and what orders we liked, and had a little bit of chat. And you know, that's. And it was, like we, yeah. said, it was a two-way thing. Incredible. We call that we call that old school hospitality, and that's very much Phil's baby. So the, the kind of what I try to do with our food, Phil's tried to do with service, and that's yeah, old school hospitality, which is exactly what you just you just said. It's you walk in, you instantly feel like you're at home, you're welcome, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're you're going to have a good time, and it, you know you have to read people. Some people just want to come in, AirPods in, eat a burger 
pay up and leave. That's totally fine. We're not expecting everyone to be, you know, like rowdy and high five. Sharing their life story with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But some people do. And some people, you know, we, we've got experiences where we've had people come in and you can see they're upset and you can see they're down. You see they're having a bad day. And, and they've emailed us to tell us this story because our managers have, you know, given them a, a beer and given them a burger and said, don't worry about that, guys. Well, that's on us today. You look like you're having a rough time, you know talk to me what's up and you know we've had these experiences where people have they've just broken up with their partners or they've just lost their job and and they've gone into a restaurant to try and get us some sort of solace of humanity you know, yeah. yeah and connection. a bit, of, bit yeah. of connection and, and and some fun and eat something that's going to make them feel a bit better and they've walked out i'm not saying they've walked out you know with a spring in their step but they've walked out feeling better than they did when they walked in and that's what a great restaurant experience can be um but you know now we've got QR codes on tables. We've got, you know, you can order and pay without speaking to a human being now in most restaurants. And it's kind of mm. we're losing that ability to actually chat to people. We're becoming so insular and it does, it terrifies the life out of me. So I just think what restaurants were when we started Honest, that is a, it's a, it seems like a dying sort of trade now where you can go in and really feel the atmosphere buzzing. And it's kind of like, you know, the world is just slowly migrating to a delivery platform, a, a saying yeah, your own I, kind of concept. I feel like it's a bit of a legacy for, you know, from the pandemic where we would cut back from human contact. I feel like there's I, 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 some businesses have realized that there's a potential cost reduction there through yeah. through the lack of human contact. And, and it's good to hear that, you know, you, you guys aren't intending to go down that route but, um... but it's a perfect storm though glenn because you know every business i know i read something the other day in the peach report that one in three restaurants in the uk is profitable at the moment um God, because terrible. all our costs are, are going the wrong way um and and all of our customers incomes are going the wrong way yeah so it's this perfect melting pot of how do we save money um how do businesses try and stay afloat like it's a it's a rough rough time um for any business but i feel like hospitality is right in the eye of the storm at the moment and it's it's tough yeah um i think we've already gone 45 i think i i said we'd probably do 45 but um <laughs> but um i mean I'm, I'm i'm happy to keep going if you can spare me the time i think it'd be, it'd be really good to kind of maybe try and kind of pull this forward a bit so Obviously, yeah. you're called Honest Burger. You started the business with um, a certain set of values of transparency, and um, presumably that idea followed through procurement. Like, how are you going to source the ingredients you're serving? Um, and the business has been going for what, like, eleven years now, and yeah, quite, quite a lot has happened in that time in in how people are. Or, I guess, the war on meat has really started escalated and now i think possibly starting to decline within the entire time that you guys have been in business um it, there must have been some interesting twists and turns in that for you so um and I'd, I'd be yeah I'd be kind of interested if you can sort of maybe give me a bit of context about where the ideas have started that have led you towards um what you're doing now which is starting to transition the business into uh, sourcing from a regenerative supply chain, especially with the beef. Um, yeah. A bit of a hi history and a timeline of that. Yeah, I mean, it all starts with that word above our door, really. And we talk about it a lot. Um, we, we did it in the early days. We, in the early days, we just thought that good ingredients equals mm -hmm. good food. And then we still do, right? You know, like, yeah. like you buy good ingredients, even if you're not a very good chef, you can generally make a good meal out of it. Um, not always, but sometimes. Um, so we wanted to source our food from good suppliers and people that we'd be proud to talk about and and we wanted them to be proud to talk about supplying us so well, it keeps you accountable right i mean it's a bit yeah. like our, our, the name of our business we it was a working title that stuck but it it ensures that you stay true to your values if it's actually in your name oh it, it's it's an app it's like a blessing and it keeps you in check and it can yeah. also be like a really good burden to have over you at all times because it really makes agree. you it's a cross to bear in a certain, worth, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly cross the bear it's brilliant um and, and a, there aren't many words that you can get away with as uh, for a, a business name 
that can also be that and, and serve that function for you. And, you know, ethical is one of them. Honest is another one of them. Um, and it, it, it started, I think it probably started for us about five years ago, for me in particular, because like I said, when we first started Honest, we just wanted to serve great food. And I'd be lying if I said I was worried about our impact on the planet back then, because I genuinely did. And I don't even think sustainability was in my vocabulary. It wasn't a part of the business at all. Um, and you know, you're, you're, you're constantly, you're, you're thinking about 10 minutes ahead when you're setting up a business like that, you know, you're constantly chasing your tail and, and I, and I was, was very much chasing my tail for, for many years when we, when we first set up Honest and it got to be, like I said, probably about five years ago, I started to read some articles that started to concern me around, um, around cattle and methane and the impact that the agriculture has on, on climate change and you know how hard it is you know you can read one article that says one thing another one that says a completely yeah. other thing and and i started to, to kind of think you know we're we're getting to be a relatively big business now um we're buying quite a lot of ingredients why aren't we talking more about them um you know restaurants in of all sizes are very good at covering up where their food comes from yeah m where murky the supply chains have, yeah you know i mean it was one of the founding things of our business is that we realized that a murky supply chain was suiting the industry very well oh um, yeah the ability so well. to, to not look not be able to look back and have that opacity um was a benefit to the industry and um and uh yeah and most people have relied on it because it's very easy to keep costs down if you don't ask too many questions Exactly. And I think that, that, that the middleman, if you think of ultimately you've got a farmer and then you've got a customer eating yeah. that farmer's produce, there's so many um, middlemen in between that system that yeah. um, my doorbell's just gone. God damn it. And my wife's out. Okay. Um, don't worry. Can I run and get it? Yeah, run and get it. I can edit, edit the little okay. section out. Go for it. Two cool. secs. Wait a minute. Hi, man. Sorry. Cheers, mate. Thanks a lot. Uh, sorry about that. That was a no. Don't worry. Really need it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so yes, yeah, supply chains have have you know murky supply chains have suited a lot of the industry because you're detaching the farmer to the yeah. customer, um, and because of that detachment, you've got lots of middlemen in the middle that are making. A cut everything single time they're, they're adding value they're providing a service um but it becomes very difficult and you know most restaurant businesses don't know where their food comes from um the vast majority there will be a wholesaler it will be a butcher it will be a um, processor yeah. so we started to think you know even back then very from day one we knew exactly the farm that our beef came from we knew um where our potatoes came from and for us that's the biggest thing for you know burger business is generally the, the two big ingredients right yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah um so when we when we really decided to 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 better our supply chain um and this was a lot of this was guilt it was me thinking we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger our supply chain's getting murkier and murkier um I need to, we need to be better. Like we're called honest. Um, just because other businesses do it one way doesn't mean that works for us. Um, and I, and I see it was a, it was a weight that I was feeling personally because, you know, like the honest was, you know, we're buying, we're buying tons and tons of beef a week. Um, and it was kind of this, this weight that I was, I was getting quite, getting quite a kind of, um, overbearing at times and then i started to look at it and think actually this is a massive opportunity we've got an opportunity to influence you know albeit a, a small part of, of the uk supply chain but it's still a part of the supply chain and we could influence farmers um and i started That's to sort of catalyst for change you know yeah yeah, yeah. and we and we've got this word above our door and our customers want us and i think and to be fair i think our customers assume that we do this stuff anyway um, and they assume businesses do do things, and this is you know, you can you can get away with murder in, in sustainability. You really can. You can you can make a wishy washy statement and back it, it up. Doesn't really meet the word sustainable. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's I, 
we've always kind of said as a business, but I've started to look at it, is that it means not making things any better or worse, really. Yeah, it's but if your baseline, yeah. if yeah. what you're trying to sustain is already buggered, then, <laughs> yeah, then it's not yeah. a good system, right? No, yeah. So so the whole, in, and the, the, the biggest thing for me around sustainability, and this is when I started to really try to entrench myself in the space and look at what a bit, how a business is tackling their impact, how a business is tackling their sustainability, and sadly, a lot of people, like what I was finding is they're making statements and they're not backing them up with anything. Mm. Big, grandiose claims. And the governments are doing it as well. It's like, oh, no, we're going to be fine. Like, by 20, like, like by 2050. responsibly sourced. Yeah. I mean, what does that mean? Yeah. It's, it's, it sounds nice. It sound, it, its intentions are good. But it doesn't no genuinely mean... Yeah. yeah. And I kind of get why, because it's hard to portray your implications on you know a label that's that big or a flyer that sits on a table you know it's hard to get the message across but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it so we start to think how can we be better i know i don't need to spend 25 grand getting our carbon numbers audited for me to know as a business that our biggest input and therefore output is going to be beef yeah um so so of all the things that i wanted to try to improve beef was the one. So I started to, to go into to conferences and talks and anyone that would have me, I would, I would listen in and, and, and try and learn more about what was available to us. And, you know, was agriculture as bad as the media is making out? Um, and I have one of the, it was probably my fifth or sixth um, session, I got into the National Farmers Union and they would put on a conference um, just off the back of, Cambridge and Oxford had taken beef off their menu because they had said it's too unsustainable. Um, we're we're making a stance and we need to get rid of it. So the Is NFU that four, invited four years ago, let's say. Yeah, about, about four years ago. Yeah, yeah Cambridge and Oxford invited. Uh, so National Farmers invited some Cambridge and Oxford students to come in and have a you know a kind of very friendly debate with some um, ecologists with some scientists um, and with some farmers and just talk yep. about the other side of the argument because the food supply chain is one of the most complicated things on the planet um, probably only second to climate change and those two things are linked and it's trying to work out the nuance between those two um, incredibly complex systems which i don't think anyone can fully grasp no, agreed. Like agreed. it's, yeah. and the thing that terrifies me is it's such the scale is so vast that if you are 0.1% out and you extrapolate that it's a hundred yeah. years forward and you're talking about Catastrophic a million difference. hectares of land or a, you know, a billion cubic feet of, of air or whatever it is, it's, it's like you go from that to that. And so I think it's, it's a very, very, it's an industry that's been reduced to a headline. Um, and as a result, it's, I don't think it's taken very seriously because it's impossible. You know, one, one day bamboo is the most sustainable thing on the planet. The next day it's a monocrop agriculture that's, that's destroying habitats and people well, are going to rainforest for it. And it's like... It's one of those things that it probably was before people, <laughs> before people said it was, you know. It's, before you know, they it's, monetized it, right? And this as is soon as you label it, then, it, then um, money comes in and, and, it, and it gets ruined. But so in, in this journey about, you know, your kind of, I, I, I would say that, you know, that point maybe three or four years ago, that was sort of peak um, or, or it, it was certainly, there was a, it was a very one-sided debate then that meat is destroying the planet. I don't think there was any nuance yeah. or balance to that at the time. And it was this very um, simple dialectic argument, meat is bad. And that's about the same time that certainly I became aware of regenerative agriculture, that hang on, there's this alternative yeah, voice, mm. there's something in the mix. Um, with that awareness, so you're, you're going to you're reading a lot, you're going to um, events, you're, you're listening to people. When, how, did, how did this sort of awareness of, of the potential of Regen Ag, how, how did that sort of start brewing within you and, and um, ultimately <clears throat> lead to where you are today? Which so it, was, it was, yeah, it was that National Farmers Union conference and I'd heard there were a lot of scientists, a lot of ecologists, people talking incredibly passionately in a lot of detail. And I'll be honest with you, a lot of the... the a lot of it went over my head a little bit at that stage. Um, 
and it was actually a young chap who who came up at the end of the um end of the day in a tweed suit and started talking about um his farm in Shropshire called James Evans um and as soon as he started talking I was like oh my god this is this sounds too good to be true this sounds like the most logical thing I've heard in a, in a long time and he didn't just talk he showed photos and he showed photos of cattle roaming in fields that looked wild they there they were there was plant pasture you know up to the the cow's ears yeah. um and they're just kind of you know meandering through this this incredibly diverse um healthy functioning field and it, and it looked so different to anything i'd seen in the past and that you know you see our wonderful patchwork quilt of you know our countryside and it's it's neat hedgerows it's and, fences, yeah, it's, it's gates, all raised and down like a tennis court right and exactly it's, it's yeah no, you could, it's no you could play golf on it right it's yeah. like and and that's what i thought you know good agriculture and good animal grazing meant um but it's only when i heard james talk and he was like this you know what we're doing here is we're trying to work sympathetically with nature and this is where farming has gone totally wrong is we've you know like like everything that goes south in in human um, existence generally is based around money we find something we monetize it it makes a small number of people very very rich and powerful who cares about the consequences and that's what's happened time and time again with pretty much every industry it, it you know there's there's a glimmer of hope there's something that seems positive and then it gets monetized and then it gets um kind of extrapolated and then and then you're in a the, this the mess we're in now and i think you know <clears throat> fertilizers and pesticides are a cracking example of that where you know the 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 incentive there was we need to feed the world more effectively yeah which is a would you you could easily say it was a massive success they fed the world the more effectively than anyone could possibly dream but at what cost yeah and that's what i don't think whether if they did know the cost then you know i hope they get their comeuppance some some somewhere um if they didn't then then all we're doing is is thinking this kind of one dimensional view which is how much money can we make out of a food system um and and you know what i'm sorry i'm kind of going on a different tangent and it is very easy right when you're going on this subject <laughs> to just go down a wormhole but for us you know when i heard james talk and i i could see that he his farm was genuinely working with nature um using nature to help his farm be more effective um instead of systems that are so heavily dependent on synthetic fertilizers and pesticides which are trying to replace nature um and the one thing you've got to remember about nature is every single thing whether it's a plant or an insect or a, an animal it has a it has a feature it does something yeah, um it, it, it's it's about it, it's striving for balance yeah but nothing nothing just exists for the sake of it there's always something that's that's a having a, a, a reason a function. Or a role. Yeah. yeah and yeah, it's yeah. incredible to see right when you yeah. see these things happen and these things um unfold and and they work like a like an orchestra it's it's amazing but it takes time it's you know humans want everything now and if it doesn't if it doesn't happen in one season then it's a failure and it's like <clears throat> well, especially if we're trying to rebalance a system that's very out of balance is you know and yeah. we're trying to let nature do it but one of the things that sort of fascinates me about the potential for regenerative agriculture is that we can manage nature to do things more to 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 repair and restore more quickly than if we left it alone yeah yeah exactly and that's the word that it's a hell of a wanky word but biomimicry is a really great term for what regenerative agriculture stands for and this is what you know when james was showing me these photographs at this presentation and he was showing me something called mob grazing and he right. had these fields that you could see were they were they were kind of like in their own um they were kind of in their own little sections little squares of this field mm -hmm. and it sounds like a small thing but what he was what they're trying to do there with mob grazing and I'm obviously I'm I'm not telling you this because you know um you know it very well but you, they're trying to mimic what that what that animal and a cow is a ruminant and a ruminant's function on the planet 
is to eat what's growing, mm-hmm. um, to gently disturb the soil with its hoof, which is a perfect implement to just gently disturb the soil, not to like plow it to hell, it's just to disturb a little bit, um, to ferment what they've eaten, and they're fermenting it into the most wonderful fertilizer for the land. So then when it comes out the other end, you've got all these insects just swarm in on it and they redistribute that cow dung around the soil to then re-fertilize the thing the cow ate in the first place. So recycling nu- nutrients. It, it's yeah, a, and it's, it's this incredible, it's an incredible cycle that, yeah, the cow eats it, it digests it, it shits it out, the insects take it back into the ground, the plants then re- reuse the, first, the, the nutrients the cow has, has um, pooped out to grow back stronger. And, and this and, builds and, more soil and the, and the system yeah, is... Yeah, builds more soil, the, the plants photosynthesize more effectively, they sequester more carbon, the root structures are stronger. You know, with root structures, you have more moisture content in the soil, you have healthier soil, you have less runoff in, in floods, you have more absorption in droughts, you have all these things happen for a reason. And they've been happening for millennia, yeah. long before humans came along and, and destroyed the whole system. So it's it just for me. To, I, I'd, I'd love to it. sort of do um, actually get together with you and the grassroots guys who you're now sourcing from, uh, and really kind of go deep on this on, on a yeah. on another on another podcast. Um, but I mean, yeah, it's it's um, if if I could just pick up on a few bits there. So sort of maybe to backtrack a bit was, um, did you guys as a business ever consider? maybe switching out to switching your patties out for plant-based versions or you know was there ever a point where you thought that's the right thing to do you know because of the you know the overwhelming narrative um before regenerative agriculture was really sort of understood was that's what we need to do did that ever sort of come into your mind as a business we're we're not a business that um forces our customers hand so i think you know, we're a business that has built its foundations on on a meat supply chain and a, and a, a good one at that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm more proud of it now than I ever have been. Um, but we're an inclusive business and we want customers to come and have a nice experience with us um, and enjoy themselves and all the things we discussed in the first part of this podcast about having, you know, a great restaurant experience. So we, we put a plant-based um, options on our menu because we do think they're a, they're a very accessible way to eat less meat. And I think it's something that, you know, you probably wouldn't expect uh, a butcher and a burger business to say, but, you know, I, I, we, the world does need to eat less meat. It's become far too, um, far too kind of sort of Reliant matter of fact cheap, now. Yeah. Cheap protein. Yeah. Yeah. We, 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 we consume cheap protein, like, you know, three, four times a day and it's, it's not, fat's not sustainable. Um, but I think for, for the, you know, your initial question around should honest, or did we ever think about going hundred percent plant-based? No, was the answer. I, okay. I genuinely don't think the world would last six months if we all went plant-based overnight. Like the argument is far more nuanced than that. We've got to start, we've got to stop looking at one extreme to the other. And I'm not, I'm not a carnivore. I'm not saying everyone just needs to eat burgers at honest every single day but I'm not a vegan at the same time. I think it's, it's a too complicated a, a problem to just have one answer to it. And, you know, plant-based meats have a lot of, of questions to answer themselves around yeah. their supply chain. Um, yeah. And, you know, monocrop agriculture is not doing the world any favours. Um, and, and just like intensively reared beef is not doing the world any favours. You know, we're looking at two bad examples of two supply chains that the world is heavily dependent on um you compare you know compare a regenerative farm beef burger to an intensively farmed um beef burger they're miles apart yeah. intensively farmed beef burger you've got loads of inputs you've got loads of outputs and all you're really getting is is you know food which is quite high in calories not very high in nutrition yeah. Lots of inflammatory fats in there and things like that. Whereas you compare that, that, that to true cost accounting. So yeah, you know, like like the cheap burger might be, have a, a shelf price of ninety nine pence versus the grass fed burger is two pound fifty. 
but the cost to the environment and you know potentially health of the cheap burger hasn't been factored into the shelf price. Well, yeah, and I think this is where it's very difficult. Is no one's fighting a fair fight here, and then I, that's the, the meat industry is they've been absolutely awful at this, as is the yeah. dairy industry. So I get that the, the you know the vegan industry is just taking playbooks out of the meat industry, which is you know let's let's manipulate our argument, let's let's find things that make us look good, and let's bury things that make us look bad, um, and let's simplify the argument to the point of you know a bite-sized analogy or a bite-sized statement and, and it's just too complicated for that and i think you know we all need to look more carefully at what we eat um but we need to learn more we need to stop you know stop reading a headline in the daily mail and thinking okay that's me now i know sustainability i'm going to now preach this to everyone i meet because the argument is just far more complex than that so um <laughs> I, I, as I said, I, I think, I think a, a good place for us to, to wrap up this podcast would be to kind of lead into where you are now and what you're doing. And then I think we yeah. can follow on with the next stage. With the grassroots guys. Well, yeah. The, the yeah. mechanics of that and how we as a business have become involved with Honest Burger and, and grassroots. And, and I think there's, there's an awful lot to talk about. But could you just sort of fill the gap between where you've got to in the story of forming your brand and, and kind of bring us up to date a little bit? So it's you know if we go from where where I met James at the NFU, I, he- I hear about regenerative farming the first time. I'm excited as anything. I speak to my founders. I speak to my CEO. I'm like, I think I found something that that we have to support um, as a beef business if we want to remain relevant. Um, I think this is the only option for us. Um, so we we the grassroots guys, basically, they they formed a business off the back of a conversation with me saying that I would, I would like you. Um, and there's three of them, there's um, James, Daniel, James Evans, and, and Alistair. Um, those three guys are the specialist boots on the ground, they're practicing farmers. Um, I can talk, you know, a good game to, to, to you or to, to a panel or something like that about regenerative agriculture, but can I go onto a farm and actually practice it? The answer is absolutely not. Um, these guys are, are practicing farmers. They've done it. They've been through the the, the um, you know problems, and then they come out with solutions. And and what we what we decided to set up was they're a collective of farmers. Um, they source our farming network now um, for Honest, um, and we 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 encountered tons of problems along the way, um, which was actually abattoirs have the most power in the uk because they have a business model which is very effective for farmers and it's effective because they just buy everything abattoirs buy whole animals and they find a purpose for every single um piece of the animal you know to the offal the hides the the um uh, the the meat obviously there's every single part of the animal the 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 abattoir has a profitable industry that they can feed into yep. and they're very effective and they have you know multi-million pound facilities so you've got these big abattoirs that do everything mm-hmm. now so for farmers their only option really is to sell to abattoirs for, for the majority of farmers because most farmers don't have a, a, a small abattoir down the road they don't have a farm shop that can take whole carcasses and so what I think we should discuss later is buying the whole animal is very tricky because it's very hard to find a home for all of the right parts um, of the animal. Tell me about it. It's, yeah, because it's, it's what we it's do. It's the butcher's well. first problem, right? You know, yeah. trying, it's, called, it's, it's called carcass utilization and it's very tricky, especially on, on a cow because it's an enormous weight. You know, you're talking about 350 kilos um, for a carcass, trying to find... Um, a home for every single part of that's very, very difficult. Um, but it's the only way you can actually work direct with a farmer is to buy, if you want to buy direct, you have to buy the whole animal because farmers farm animals. They don't farm cuts. You know, you guys, you sell a lot more steaks than you sell um, chuck steak, for instance, or four quarter. You sell yeah. more ribeyes and sirloins. Yeah. You can't go to a farmer and go, yeah, I want to buy five tons of ribeye off you, please, mate. You know, no, I mean, care about the rest of it. There was always that running joke with farm shops is that, you know, um, every time, every time you, you kill another cow, you have to buy another freezer for the mints, you know, because yeah. 
we, you know, we can sell the steaks, we can sell the roastings, and um, but um, again, that sort of neatly segues into into another conversation we need to have. But what's what, what's the scale? How are you? Because um, you guys have fifty restaurants now, is that right? We're forty three restaurants. Oh, forty three, yeah. right? Mm. Um, that's quite a big. I mean, your 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 demand for meat is quite high. How, what sort of scale are you able to do? now and how, how, what's the plans to scale up the regenerative supply chain how, how's, how's the mechanics of that working well this is the uh, i think a really important thing to say is the, the first thing first issue we found is our, our original blend for our burgers was chuck steak and rib cap which the carcass utilization on that is terrible it's a very small amount of, of, the, of an animal that we're purchasing so firstly that meant we couldn't work direct with farmers because we're not buying enough of the animal to dictate how they farm that animal and secondly, we need a lot of animals because of that. So yeah. that's why at the moment we were, we were buying all of our beef from an abattoir and they were finding a home for everything else. Um, we were taking just that small section, everything else they were finding a home for. So because of that, you, like I said, we needed loads of animals, which means we needed loads of farms. So if we wanted to do this um, you know, and try and source from regenerative farms, we would have had to try to convert hundreds of farms yeah which is just not going to happen it's yeah. impossible and it's what most businesses face most restaurant concepts and steak steak concepts are the are the worst they have the biggest hurdle for this because they're whatever they do there's only a set amount of steaks on a carcass it's about 10 percent um so you're only ever buying 10 percent which means you need a lot of beef because you're selling a lot of steaks um which means you need a lot of farmers so it's very very tricky so we decided very early on, if we're going to make this work, we're going to have to buy the whole animal. And we're going to basically have the reverse problem of most businesses where we can make a burger blend out of the majority of the carcass, which is the forequarter, so the, the, the two front um, legs, um, yeah. the, the flank, which is all the belly, um, and some trim. We can make a burger out of all of that, and then we need to find a home for the steaks. Um, which is where you guys come in, right? You you've got the opposite problem of us. Yeah, where, yeah, completely. You, know, yeah. you you buy a carcass, you need to find the the home for the mints, and you sell the steaks with ease. So it's it, when we start to realize this, it was it was a hurdle for sure. But it actually, you start to think more clearly, and it's like, okay, that means that we need way less um, animals, which means we need way less farmers. So which you've got means a lot the whole control. Yeah, yeah, and the whole thing is just more manageable. It's totally achievable. Like. If we were going to try and do our original blend, we'd have needed about two hundred farmers to make um, this work. Fundamentally, so you, you've—I mean—you've really changed what the product is. Uh, how is you know a whole carcass blend versus a specific blend? Uh, how uh, is there any difference? Do you think the customers have noticed any difference? We've done a lot of tests on this, right? And this was our first hurdle. And everyone's like, "Oh, you need to use brisket. You need to use chuck. You need to use X, Y, and Z." Blah, blah, blah. The only thing that really shifts the dial on a burger blend is the fat content. Right. It really is. And I, you know, I've, I've tried countless blends and you can't tell the difference unless you change the fat content. Um, so we bought a piece of kit called a fat analyzer, which is a very expensive bit of kit, but it means you can very accurately test um, the, the fat percentage of a burger blend that kind of unlocked it for us because it is more complicated for sure we're making a blend out of you know 15 cuts instead of two um but ultimately we're just we're just gunning for that fat percentage and as soon as we get that right the, the blend tastes very very consistent I, I but i mean there there is a sort of a bit of a difference between conventionally finished which is grain finished you tend to have like a sweeter flavor and, yeah and more the, buttery as well i think and yeah and then the the, the sort of 100 percent grass finish a lot of people if they're used to eating conventional meats when they try grass finished they're not used to the lack of sweetness and butteriness and it's got more of a herbal i, I yeah. think that some of the best you know some of the, the most natural meats have tasted they almost have a sort of slightly green tea kind of herbal flavor going on in the meat has that do you think that shifted at all in your blend or not so much really because again because it's we've got you know a burger blend needs to be about 20 percent fat which is quite right. a high amount of fat and so the fat is always going to be the dominating flavor but i totally agree with you the, the you know a pasture fed um system you end up with you know that 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 more intense flavor you get with rump um 
yep. steak. So I think you get that flavor across all of the um, staking cuts, in my opinion, that it's just a much more powerful, um, almost kind of you nuttier flavor. Yeah. yeah, 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 it is it's quite gamey. Um, in comparison with you can get, you know, quite kind of bland sort of insipid flavors from corn fed, but you get that texture um, yeah. or corn finish. You get a very rich, um, you know, that kind of the, uh, the USDA steaks that I've had in the past where you're like, I mean, it's, it's, it tastes good. You can't deny that. Um, but it's unnatural. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cows, cows wouldn't be, you know, choosing to eat grain unless they absolutely had to. Well, they're, they're basically kind of obese by that stage, aren't they? They're not healthy. Yeah. You know, well, I know. And I mean, if you look, if I always think if you, if you, did an autopsy on a human being and you looked at one of their muscles and it looked like a, a wagyu piece of muscle or a, you know a cobra <laughs> piece of muscle you'd be like fuck me that human was a yeah. bloody unhealthy pe- yeah. you know that guy sat on the sofa eating doritos yeah i know <laughs> and it's like then that but that's you know that's revered in in <laughs> so many cultures so yeah i mean it's it's a it's been a, an amazing experience for us and one that we've jumped whole wholeheartedly into because it generally feels right and it's us you know we've, we've been accused of greenwashing by doing this process and it, that really does cut me deep because i see i see what true green rock washing is and i look at what we're doing and i'm like this is this is so much more authentic and it feels so um so much realer than anything i've read about in the past and it's not perfect and we haven't come out and said you know this is it this is the answer we are we are going to be carbon neutral. We are going to be net zero in five years because we don't know. But what I do know is I speak to many people who've been farming this way, and they've seen it with their own eyes. They've seen their land become greener, become lusher, become more biodiverse. We have far more species of birds and animals have flocked into this tiny little area of the countryside because you know, surprise, surprise, they're not covering it in poisons. And, and it's things like that yeah that you know i know and it's it's no like brainer. i know and it's the i think the plant-based community are they're they're i feel like they're deliberately avoiding the fact that plant-based diets are 100 percent dependent on poisons and yeah, you know or, that's what pesticides or on animal manure well you know if in, in a good system yeah but yeah. very few use animal manure um because it's you know you're not going to get the same yields and it's 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 just we need to look at we we need we need to stop villainizing both sides of this argument and we need to start trying to work together um and it's a really difficult one because it's it's a you know plant based has become a belief system um and belief systems aren't always based on fact anymore no, um, agreed. And yeah. I think it's and 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 let's face it, there are very murky facts on both sides of the fence here. So. It's very, very difficult. Um, but my, I have a, a very fortunate um, view here is I've seen things firsthand. I've spoken to farmers who've gone from an intensive arable system to a regenerative beef system. And they can, they can show me photographs saying, this was my soil uh-huh. two years ago. That's this it, is it for me. now. Yeah. But I know we, have, we may not have you know, peer review papers saying, the percentage carbon sequestration from there to there well that's coming yeah we will have exactly yeah. and and you know it's and i'm not i'm you know I, I know one of the big arguments about regenerative farming is it's too land heavy i'm not saying that regenerative will work for the world i'm saying it will work for our small sector and our small supply chain where you know how we want to operate and if other businesses would like to follow suit then i think that would be great i think it would give the whole movement more momentum um but we need to change what we're doing because we're headed for a, a disaster otherwise i think no one's really um disputing that fact completely agree so um just to sort of wrap this up um is it is it known which of your restaurants are transitioned already to um to regenerative and how quickly do you do you think this is going to become company wide so we're going actually um, this Friday. We're going up to twelve restaurants. Um, oh wow! Okay. So we'll have twelve honests that will be um, supplied by uh, regenerative farms. Um, the reason that we're, it's quite 
it's going to take us about 18 months um probably to the, yeah, the end of next year is when we should have the whole estate um supplied and the, the part of that is there is a there is a cost to it um yeah. and you know if, if businesses have to be profitable in order to be sustainable um so we need to spread the cost and we also need to build the supply chain and the supply chain doesn't exist right now so we're building it that takes time um but yeah, we we should like I said, we'll have twelve by well that meet they'll, they'll be in the restaurants by next Wednesday, um, and then we'll be rolling out uh, much more aggressively next year. But yeah, so it's a tough time right now when all of our costs are literally Star just off. going like that. Um, but we we believe in this and we think it's a really important part of our business, and we've made promises to our customers um, and we've made promises to our farmers. So it's. It's something that we we firmly think for a business to stay relevant, we should all be thinking this way. I completely agree. Um, that's taken us to a lot longer than I said we'd be on this. Sorry, gotcha. <laughs> but um, I, I really look forward to um, a part two where we can talk to the farmers who are supplying you, and, and I think you know maybe get around a table and and, um, and record something in person, and then we can tell the story a bit more about the mechanics of it, but. Um, I've absolutely en uh, enjoyed hearing the the sort of founder story and your your, your sort of business forming um, was absolutely fascinating and uh, had you know wonderful kind of uh, humanity in there for me that was uh, fantastic to hear so um, I think people are going to get a lot out of that Tom I'm going to let you go I know you've got a very busy day um, thank you so much for your time yeah today. thank you Glenn and um, I really look forward to part two great me too yeah I look forward to it and uh, thanks for having me on.